On today's Big Gay Agenda is a very special book club. Today we will finally dive into Rainbow Islands, a book we have talked about over and over on this podcast. But what makes it extra special is that we are not alone. We'll be talking with the author, Devin. So welcome to the chaos, Devin. Thanks for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yay. We are so excited. Um, I want to start before we kind of get into questions and kind of explain how we found out about this book. So one of my friends like recommended this book to me, um, my friend Pete, and Pete found this book at a very pivotal moment in their life. And I want to read you uh, something that they sent to me because I, I told them we were going to talk to you. And so this is a message from Pete uh, to quote, uh, the first time I found Rainbow Islands, it was by accident. The day before I started my transition, it held my hand like a kindly old man offering me tea and a warm fire in from a storm. I don't know how else to describe it. I've reread it so many times and recommended it to every queer person I meet. I want a tattoo for it. V.S. Malastrum. I'm so grateful for what you've done, and I'm as grateful for the chance to say thank you. Oh, God, that was so sweet. You're like, you're going to make me cry in my first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it made me cry already yeah <laughs> well to that be honest so much. the book made me cry so <laughs> oh god thank you yeah, so much that means I'm so glad. much I'm, to me i'm glad that we got the chance to do this good i'm happy to hear that there's so many good things about this book not only is it does it you know help people my my absolute favorite thing about it though is is how we got the book. Like for me, it's proof that like not all heroes wear cape, capes. <laughs> so for those that don't know, the origin of Rainbow Islands um, starts like this. Once upon a time, there was a troll on Tumblr that was wildly unaware of the power of the internet. <laughs> so uh, Devin, could you explain the infamous Tumblr post that brought us here together today? So uh, apparently there's a post where this like terrible bigot guy was like, homosexuality is unnatural because if you took all of the lesbians and put them on an island and all of them put them on another island, they would die out within a generation. Um, and then a, a lot of like queer people got a hold of this post and they started like riffing on it and making comments and being like, well, where's this, where's this straight island that's exiling people? And like, have you seen lesbians around wood? They would build boats immediately. And, and then it became this like, dystopian like adventure story about like the the queer people on the islands getting into like a war with the straight people who exiled them and I was like okay this is super cool and it was in my mind for like a while and I just was like you know I feel like I actually have to try this and put this into an actual book because like nobody else is apparently in a, it's been a while and I haven't seen anybody else take this idea and I'm like I'm just going to roll with it because, I mean, how many different variations can you make? Infinite, right? So I decided to do this for NaNoWriMo 2016. <laughs> uh, if, if you don't know, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month. It takes place in November. And if you remember November 2016 and what that was like, uh, I wrote this book in a white hot fever mm. <laughs> of like despair and rage and like kind of defiant hope. And it's basically like a, an expression of all of my like queer anger and frustration and, and also like a love letter to the community and uplifting myself and trying to like get some positivity out of this like horrible thing that we all went through yeah the the uh, i love that a love letter to the community is definitely how it reads and that was my impression as well so thank you for being the hero that like actually made it a story because it's so so good and so fun and just the power of the internet is the best <laughs> it's internet at its finest i saw the tumblr post after reading it and i was like oh shit okay right? no me right? too and i was There's just reading and i'm like <laughs> it's one of those instances where everyone's like somebody should write this and then right. thank <laughs> goodness you did 
I actually like kind of poked around and like searched to see if there was anything. I mean, it's obviously hard to like find it based on like a keyword or something, but I did actually kind of poke around and see like, has anybody actually run with the story yet? Because I didn't find anything that anybody actually wrote a novel based on any of these ideas. And I even write in my, you know, in my office notes, I don't even think that I own this idea, the general idea of this, like, what was kind of played out. It was just like, it's only literally the story I wrote is the story I wrote, but please go ahead and write all the different versions with all of the different like orientations and, you know, people with disabilities mm -hmm. and different people with different like racial backgrounds. And so like, please write all these stories because we need them. Like you're going to write a totally different version than I am. So just please go and, and do something like that. I haven't seen anybody else do it. It would be really awesome if somebody did, I would like, you know, love to do like co-marketing and stuff with them just to like, hey man, this is really cool. You should see this. That would be amazing. Yes, I would love that so, so much. Yeah, so if you're if you're out there, writers that are looking for a new story idea, please continue Rainbow Islands in your vision. All right, but in this version of Rainbow Islands, uh, our protagonist of the story is Jason. And when we are first introduced to Jason, we learn that he is being exiled by the mainlanders, which are the Christian Republic in the book. Um, and he's being exiled because he's queer. And at the time he's being exiled, he's basically given a choice, either conversion camp like Rebecca, the girl Jason was kissing, or exile to Rainbow Islands. And Jason comments that technically he had a choice between those two things, but for him, there was no choice. So I'm curious why why Jason felt so strongly entrenched that like there was no decision for him. From the um, he's I mean you know to be told like transparent about like he's basically sort of like a fantasy version of like me as a teenager, and I wanted to kind of lean into some of my own like personal feelings and experience. And I had always been like I know a lot of there are a lot of queer people who like wish they weren't queer because of what society says about queer people and how it makes them feel and they try to like wish it away or pray it away and I had never actually felt that way before like I desperately prayed to be like magically turned into a boy but I've never actually wanted to not be queer and I feel like if I had been put in that situation as much as I am like truly and deeply a coward I don't think I'd be able to like not you know I, I don't think I'd be able to to, to live with myself if that picked like going to a conversion camp I think I would have been like I'm out of here you know whatever comes I'm out of here and I I just let that be a thing because um I um you know that the Jason's choice kind of makes it a, a statement of like what his personality is and his feelings about you know even though he doesn't really know anything about his identity and the community he's going to be um, integrated into, like he still has those strong feelings of like, okay, now that I've been given this choice, I'm forced into it, I don't want to deny myself. And I would rather like head into the unknown and possible like a life of, you know, uh, difficulty and misery than survive in a world that's going to turn me into something I'm not. That's so beautifully put. So I I love that it's coming from your perspective of like what you would you would have done when you were Jason's age, like in that position. So I'm curious what everybody else, big gay energy podcast people, what what would you have done if you were like in Jason's position given this like ultimatum choice? I think it <clears throat> depends on which part of my life. Cause now, um uh yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to those islands. <laughs> but it's definitely in like high school i i don't know what my choice would have been like because like you're leaving your whole family as well right and it's just yeah i i wish i would know i wish i'm who i was today back then to like have always gone to the islands because i mean the islands seem really cool <laughs> I don't <clears throat> I don't think I could have made any other choice but but going because even thinking about myself back at that age 
just hearing the blatant homophobia happening around me because I grew up in the well I mean like not like it didn't happen everywhere but in the south <laughs> in the 90s it was just like even my softball coach was like if there were any lesbians on this team I would they would immediately be kicked off and I'm just sitting there like well guess I know why my friend didn't make the team and I guess I better not say anything to anybody about anything so I definitely would have had to go to the island because I can't imagine being confined and constricted and forced into a like like in the book the hole because it's just such a metaphor for the whole thing they're putting you in in the hole is what they're doing and forcing their ideals on you until you break so I would have had to go to the islands yeah I, I agree with that. I, I agree with both of you. Um, and Caitlin, I, to your point, like when you're young, like it is a hard, it is a hard choice because like, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> you would have to leave, like at the point where Jason's being given this like choice, what he knows about rainbow islands is propaganda from the people who are sending him there. So he's like, Oh, it's a terrible place. And you're just going to die. And it's like, it's, uh, they described it as like humane death. Cause they're like, well, we don't have to kill them. Like with the guns, we're just going to send them on this Island where they'll just die off and like keep our hands you know kind of like blood free so like what he knows is like it's basically he's gonna die there versus like this not which is not what he finds and so to do so he'd have to leave his family versus like being indoctrinated by force essentially into christianity which like i think if i was 16 and like jason's age i would choose the islands if i was younger than that maybe i would have made a different decision mm -hmm. because i grew up like in a catholic household and stuff like that and so like i i kind of went through a similar thing with jason um where I was kind of like grew up in that environment. And so if I was younger, maybe I would have been more impressionable and more like, yeah, like maybe it's me. I'm the, pro yeah, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, <laughs> you know, uh, fix me. But at 16, I was like, yeah, fuck that. I think I know who I am at this point. It's I'm not the problem. You guys are the problem. And I would have left. So it, it's just an interesting question that depends on like your age, where you're at in your life, I think. And perhaps your choice would have been different, but it's just a very That's interesting scenario. The other aspect is I, I do because when I was growing up, we ended up going to I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with the, the Church of Christ. <laughs> like a mega church? <laughs> no, like oh. the, the the very uh, fundamentalist type. Yikes. They speak in tongues and etc etc in any case so i ended up uh we ended up going to that church sometimes and anytime that church was involved because my relatives are very religious i even as a kid was like this is bullshit and it's it's the worst fantasy book i've ever read i love fantasy and this is horrible so can i uh it, it always felt so culty to me that i don't think i could have ever gone that's another reason i couldn't have gone to the conversion camp it just it's always felt like a, a culty type feel with totally. any kind of super organized religion yeah i think i just struggled with accepting myself for so long that like because i didn't come out um to family until my sophomore year of college so i wish again wish high school i was out because it wouldn't so great but because i was always trying to convince myself i wasn't i don't think i would have been strong enough especially with what they know about the islands before even getting there because right. we have the benefit of knowing mm -hmm. how great these islands are but they don't <laughs> no all right, so when Jason is exiled, he basically gets to bring some possessions with him. And one thing I love is that Jason's like, I don't need anything except my books. Devin, is that what you would have brought with you? Just Same. a bunch of books? Because <laughs> I'd be totally. Being told I'm being sent to like an island that's basically just, you know, it's going to be some fruit and some sand. And that's, you know, you're going to live in a hut and have nothing. I'm, I, you know, I like, okay, I got to bring some books with me. <laughs> bring all my favorites loaded up. I and like that. he says, like, I don't care about the clothes because I hate everything, you know, that yeah, I put on my favorite pair of pants and then that's all I need. Just going to load it up with. 
absolutely teen me would have been I, like well, Isaac from all Heartstopper the also um agrees with you I do love when he gets to, he eventually, when he starts on New Hope and he gets to the library and then he's like, books! And then he's like, but no one can have my books. <laughs> like, I love that internal model. Yes. <laughs> it's so real. The initial possessiveness of like, okay, I'm not, looks like people share their stuff, but ah, uh, these are my books. <laughs> yeah, these are my books. I also love, because to me, when I read that part, it kind of struck me as, the library as the if you had a church on on rainbow islands it would be the library <laughs> right like and that's the, re ways, yeah. the religion is knowledge acceptance and yeah mm -hmm. so i love that um apart from that i also appreciated the different governing systems for each group of rainbow people uh, it was a super realistic concept, and I'm curious what made you decide on each one, and if you could tell us a little bit about the, that decision. I think a lot of it was just thinking, like, okay, if these islands are, like, at least semi-independent once they, when they start, um, like, each, like, each group of, like, general group of, like, queer people, they have mm -hmm. slightly different cultures to you know to a degree and and we all kind of know right. that too like okay i was thinking like all right so if you have an island full of lesbians like what are they what are they going to come up with as their system and you know it's a little bit less like formal and they have like a matriarch and it's you know somebody who's given that title of like it, it, it's kind of a, a almost like a parental title uh, um and then you know the the, the uh, gay island uh, Alexandro society it has a, just has a mayor and it you know it's a little bit more like a, a like a city structure and then the aeronautica has like the, the triumvirate and I just thought that was like a cool thing I can't remember exactly what the idea for that was it was something like I think it was like my idea was like that the hospital and the university and um and like a uh, like a science place or something and the and and the, each of those three like key um pillars of of the island has the representative and then the the buccaneers is sort of like the you know consensus chaos of you know every captain is their own representative and uh and then i was like okay they can't stand all the time to the conference. so they're going to vote to pick like people to represent like the whole but i thought that was kind of cool to have everybody has a little bit of a different system but they all interact with each other all the time and when they have to get down to, you know, making a huge decision that's going to affect everybody there, they they still have a system in place for like consensus across all of the different communities. It was awesome. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed that. And my uh, my only complaint is that I wish there was more book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is always a good complaint to have with a book. One of the things that I really loved reading is Jason witnessing this island for the first time, being like, oh my gosh, all these people are being themselves. Uh, so in the book, the capital of Sapphos is New Hope. And this brought back a core memory I kind of forgot about. So when I was about 12 or 13, uh, my family visited New Hope, Pennsylvania. And I don't know if you know that uh, town at all, but it's a place where the first place I saw where pride flags were on basically all the businesses, all the houses, there were so many pride flags and people were just being themselves. Like it was the first time I saw same sex couples holding hands and kissing publicly, not caring about it, anyone, what anyone thought. And growing up, my family would make jokes about uh, gay people. So like in my head, it's not that they weren't accepting, but it's just like they were a joke. And it was just like never something I personally witnessed. So having this town and me witnessing all this, it just really opened my world. And I remember the feelings and it's exactly what Jason was feeling when he witnessed this island. and. So thank you for capturing that. 
I, I'm so glad that it, it works out and then it, it like impacts people because that was the feeling I wanted to capture of this. What What is it like the first time you truly see your community and know that other people like you exist and they are happy and they have love and they have family and they've built a whole world where we can be ourselves. And I just was like, Okay, I'm gonna like pour all of my feeling into this and and hope that it you know reflects back on the reader when they're reading. It was beautiful. And Theora let me borrow her book, and so she has notes in her book, and I loved like being able to read it while I was reading. And she asked a question: uh, What would I have been if I was raised on Rainbow Islands? And I know that was just a question for herself, but I am actually curious what everyone's answers would be to this. I know I would have realized I was trans way sooner. <laughs> 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 like I always knew I wished to be a boy. Oh, for sure. And the portrayals that I ever really saw of trans people in like media was like, either they were like on talk shows as this big joke, or they were in these like sort of attempting to be thoughtful documentary things where they would portray trans people as like, they were so miserable in their previous life that it was kind of like, I have to change my gender or I'm going to kill myself. And I was like, well, I never really think anything like that. So I must not be what they are because I'm not miserable. And it took until by 30s until I finally saw like a regular trans man who was like a nerdy dude and had a happy life and just was a, a guy that it clicked for me though I'm like I could be this too and if I had been you know raised in a community like the Rainbow Islands I would have known from like you know tiny that people like this existed and I could be that too yeah I want to read where that thought kind of came from so it was in chapter 15 and it's right after jason like his plan to defeat the kraken works and everyone's like yeah we got to give you a cool nickname now because you're your success like jason the kraken slayer and he's like kind of struggling to accept himself as like a hero because he still has so much ptsd from like the christian republic where he was just hiding who he was and he views himself as a coward and kind of things like that and so there's this quote where he says and I'm quoting the book here. If I'd been raised in Rainbow Islands, I might have been downright dull. A quiet kid who stuck to himself and spent a large portion of his time reading. Then again, maybe I wouldn't have escaped into books so often if real life hadn't been so terrible. And so, like, for me, that's exactly how I feel. So, like, I think we, you know, obviously we have a podcast here about queer representation in media because it's important. And for sometimes that's all we get, like you're, you explained to Devin, and it can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what we're viewing. But if it's just part of our normal lives, we wouldn't have to like escape into media to see ourselves. So I, I, I agree with you. I feel like the journey of like self-discovery would have been a lot simpler, maybe accelerated if that was part of the society we were just raised in right off the bat. And I think for Jason too, he wouldn't have struggled with seeing himself as like a whole, you know, complete person, a hero, things like that, because he wouldn't have had all that PTSD and just that the voice in the back of his head. That's like, you're bad. Like that comes from that, you know, upbringing he had. So I feel like I related to him in that aspect of like, wow, like, who would have, would I have been? Would I have been like me now? Or could I have been a completely different person if, like, I never had that negativity to begin with? So I, I love that scene. I know I keep talking about how I wish I knew <laughs> earlier, but I feel like if I was on these islands, I wouldn't have hated myself for so long, like, internally, like, not even realizing that I hated myself, but, like, that's basically what I was doing. As I'm like, I... There's no way I like uh, girls. Like, and I was just like trying so hard to convince myself that I was straight. And I'm just like, I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> and I hated it so much. And then as soon as I let myself be me, I found my people. And it's it's beautiful and powerful. And 
I wish we could have the acceptance that there is on these islands. So I think it would help a lot of people. Totally. Yeah. The It's just a not having that trauma growing up because like you're the most impressionable when you're developing as a as a child into teenager into adulthood so that's the time period where we're in <clears throat> encountering all of this negativity and it's it really is trauma um deep-seated for a lot of people uh different for everyone but i definitely would have been like the same as caitlin like i just would have been able to be myself so much quicker in life and avoided a lot of difficulty with within myself and externally like my my dad asked me if I was gay in a really funny way when I was 13 and I I didn't know at the time so I was just like uh no I just you know so I just was like no I don't think I even really knew what gay was at the time. So, <laughs> cause it's just, you didn't see it. And that's the thing is if we were on rainbow Island, we would have seen it. We would have known, had so much more freedom just to explore who we are, be that straight, queer, whatever. So I think it could help straight people as much as it could help gay people in a lot of ways. And it's not bad to know what else is out there. Yeah, sure. it's not. Like, why are we limiting ourselves? I don't get it. And, like, you know, um, I mentioned, like, you know, a lot of stuff in the book about since people are having kids, because there's many ways to have kids and some, you know, queer people are buying pan and all this other stuff. And uh, there are straight people there, too, because they have kids that are straight and they know they're comfortable with themselves and accepting and you know they understand what all their options are and they can be you know they're not shoved into it and they're not shoved into like super limiting gender roles either so they can just be whoever they are in their natural personality with having to, without having to like conform to what people have taught them about what you know men and women are and I like that, you know, made sure to like, oh, it's like straight people too, because their babies are born there. And, you know, <laughs> that's what happens. I think whoever with that original Tumblr post came up with that whole concept had half a brain cell because <laughs> it's pretty obvious that you can just, there are other ways to make babies, guys. <laughs> just saying. Well, and even like historically, we have uh, a lot of history of like people who were, um, like out with each other choosing to get married and have kids when it as like kind of as a shield but also like they wanted to have families and they made those choices to like like gay men les mm -hmm. marrying lesbian women and they made those choices that they wanted to have kids and, and be married for that protection of like society but they were out to each other and had you know uh, romantic lives outside of mm -hmm. that marriage and i was like okay there's so many options with Rainbow Islands, and also we have, you know, Aeronautica, Steampunk Island with technology, or beyond what the you know, Christian Republic has, so, like, artificial insemination, like, you know, simple level, but, like, that exists too, and buy and pay and people exist, and, you know, eventually, uh, as time goes on, there's more straight people, there's, you know, and trans people, like, can choose to have kids, like, there's so many options of, like, Obviously, lots of babies are going to be born, and that's like like when Jason first comes to New Hope, he's like, "Wait a minute, there's kids here, way younger than because there's like a limit, you know. Even the Christian Republic has a limit on what they're gonna, what age they're gonna send mm -hmm. people, because they, of course, in their mind, they believe like queer young kids don't exist. It's a sexual thing. So now, now you're of an age that you're making decisions um, about." you know, sexual attraction and things like that. So that's, that's kind of their cut out. Now you're of an age that you're making decisions um, about, you know, sexual attraction and things like that. So that's, that's kind of their cutoff of like, their what they believe, you know, queer people exist as. Yeah. And 
kind of in that line before Jason arrives, his understanding of queerness is limited by the narrow-minded Christian society that he was raised in, but his concept of sexuality just expands dramatically as he integrates into a true queer culture. Um, so do you feel like exploring rainbow islands is meant to be a metaphor for discovering your own sexuality and identity? For, for like everybody too. Yes. And, and I was meant to be what happens when you're really fully integrated into that queer community and you can see all of the different options and talk to people who are both different and similar to you and, and really that freedom body. They just want to like hold hands and kiss and be romantic and like, you know, that kind of stuff where they're like, I'm actually not into the sex thing. And that's an option that a lot of people, you know, body, they just want to like hold hands and kiss and be romantic and like, you know, that kind of stuff where they're like, I'm actually not into the sex thing. And that's an option that a lot of people, you know, that haven't been exposed to that community, they don't know that that's an option. Uh, or, or like they, you know, oh, I'm just, I wanted to like get all that stuff. And, and I wanted to show too, Jason's struggling a little bit with some of those concepts. There's so much new information being, get, I wanted to like get all that stuff. And, and I wanted to show too, Jason's struggling a little bit with some of those concepts. There's so much new information being get conservative negative uh, view of uh, queerness, even though he, you know, he knows he's queer and he's comfortable with that to a certain degree, learning all these different things about the various like sexualities and genders and things like that. He struggles a little bit with getting those concepts to a certain degree, learning all these different things about the various like sexualities and genders and things like that. He struggles a little bit with getting those concepts and, and kind of mentally corrects himself too because it's like it's okay when you're new to your identity and you're new to the community you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna have jives and, and kind of mentally corrects himself too because it's like it's okay when you're new to your identity and you're new to the community you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna have bad thoughts about people because that's what you've been taught and it's okay to have those feelings and those thoughts but you gotta like teach yourself to get out of it and really, really accept other people, no matter what their identity is. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that another big part of Jason's journey that kind of influences everything you're just talking about is the deconstruction that he goes through. And I found that to be very timely because a lot of people are publicly posting on social media their journey of deconstructing, like a lot of ex-evangelicals, at least in America. And as so it seems to me like as Jason spends more time with the rainbow folk, he unlearns that internalized like misogyny, homophobia, the conformity, like all that stuff he that he was like indoctrinated into essentially in the Christian Republic. And personally, I found this to be a really realistic and relatable aspect of Jason's journey. So I'm curious um, if that came from personal experience or that was just something you were integrating like into the story based on like the Tumblr post. But like personally, I wasn't raised like super Christian or super restricted, but I know a lot of people like homophobic and transphobic. But like personally... I wasn't raised like super Christian or super restricted, but I know a lot of people who have a lot of different experiences. And I basically like just projected like, what if I had been raised in this, you know, evangelical Christianity culture, what would I have felt like? What would I have been thinking? And that kind of like, you know, um, this uh, it pushed stuff to a, a higher level of things that I did experience. So, um, and then I, again, I've like, you know, read comments from people and I've talked to people who were raised in much more um, restricted cultures of homophobia and transphobia and, and negativity and, and what, what they were feeling like too. So I was trying to kind of integrate those two pieces of like my true experience. And then like, what would it have been like to be raised in a much, much worse conditions? I mean, obviously like it, it hits you anyway because our society is like that you're getting those messages even if you're not conscious about that you're getting those messages so i'm just like let's like pump this up to a higher level 
Yeah, absolutely. And so to me, it felt really relatable. And I'm just curious if Caitlin and Brie, you you found that to be relatable growing up in America also. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was be, for all the reasons I've kind of already stated. And uh, also through Jason learning about the amount of different ways that people can identify and the different culture within those that are out there that was really relatable for me because there was a time period in my life where if you had said the words non-binary I would have had no fucking clue what you were talking about and now and then learning about it like and kind of like Jason in my mind it was like oh that makes sense and so you're all of those prior ideas that you had about things kind of get uh demystified and kind of like okay it makes sense that, that i can let go of that now so i mean and that that was a big thing f for me is finding out that i didn't have to think of myself as within a binary so like just going be i don't have to be classified it's basically it like i have freedom and that gave me a lot of relief and joy in my life that i didn't have to worry about doing that to myself internally so i really really freaking love jason like this is literally one of the best this is like my the this book really got me i'll just put it that way we can't even figure out her words That's i how can't she loves it. <laughs> it's i read a lot of books in a year and this is in my top two books that i've read this year i don't remember like homophobic stuff happening growing up i think i just wasn't aware of it i like, i was sheltered but like not like consciously sheltered i went to a catholic school until through fourth grade some of fifth grade i think and i mean i also fail religion incredibly every year but that's a whole <laughs> other story i could not pay attention to it i didn't care so i didn't have to go and learn anything because apparently i learned jack shit but anyway of you actually <laughs> Yeah, it's it's more of a I could sit there for an hour and do nothing. <laughs> I have a lot of patience. <laughs> so I guess I don't know. It it's just ingrained in you subconsciously, I guess, that it's not okay somehow because you don't see it. So it's like it's man and woman and they're together and Yeah, so I'm l I'm glad that I didn't have like people in my life who were like completely homophobic and like completely against it. And I come across people now and I'm just like how how can people be like that? Um but yeah, so I found it relatable in the fact that um I understood cuz like I knew of other people who were like very very uh, religious and morals like you had to do this and it's like not even just for um sexuality but like they basically define your entire life and you have to follow a made-up book <laughs> but yeah anything else you want to like i said it's about? the worst science fiction book i've ever read <laughs> or i think the key is that say. What Rainbow Islands is really showing for me is that like knowledge is power and that knowledge and the, and the setting of Rainbow Island gave Jason agency to make a choice. So not only did he not know there were choices before going there, because like, like you said, Devin, it's just like gay or straight, that's it. But then when he gets there, he's like, oh, there's other options. So like things I didn't know about. So knowledge is power. And then he had the agency to make the choice because constantly it's reinforced to him like, hey, you can pick your name. Hey, if you tell us you're a boy, we believe you. Like whatever you say you identify with, if you want to identify, that's cool. We accept you as you are. 
you know, I think that's really the key. And that's where like our reality in America clashes with what we would like it to be, which is Rainbow Islands, because here there's rules enforced, whether you're aware of them or not, or like propaganda that's enforced, whether you're aware of it or not. And so that shapes how you think, because you don't know there are options if you're only taught it's this or that, this or that, but it's like, it's not just this or that. And once you realize that it's, it's liberating, which is what I think Jason feels. But I also want to just, uh, before we move on to the next question, just because I don't want anyone who like actually does is religious and has faith like yes. to think that they're wrong for feeling like that. Like mm-hmm. it just because the three of us are not religious. Like it's not we're not saying like you shouldn't believe in anything because just like in the book, um, Jason learns that there's still I believe there's a church yep, and like, that people still believe in God and they yeah and. There was, so, uh, there's specifically, there's a church in New Hope that he like walks past and he's really surprised to see it. And they're like, oh yeah, no, some people still believe. And I was kind of throwing that out as like, there are accepting churches that are very like queer friendly. And I just was like, mm-hmm. obviously there are going to be some people who make those uh, like deconstruct from within and, you know, take the, the homophobia and the transphobia like out of their Christian beliefs. And you know, still, still have faith in God and Jesus and believe in like that kind of stuff, but, but taking out all the negative stuff so that they can believe like, you know, God loves me as I am. And there's plenty of like, you know, in real world, like there's plenty of uh, uh, gay and and trans and queer Christians that truly believe and are, you know, faithful and all that other stuff. I at least wanted to put old people who embrace both and that's fine. But I didn't want to like dwell on it too much because I was kind of not, mm-hmm. you know, I just wanted to make sure it was like, at least acknowledged in there that like, it's fine if you're still Christian, as long as you're not like feeding into that hate of yourself and your community in there that like, right. it's fine if you're still Christian, as long as you're not like feeding into that hate of yourself and your community. Yeah, that's really important because I think sometimes we forget to mention that, you know, even though the three of us aren't, don't identify with being Christian or aren't religious in any way that there's nothing wrong with that. Like, it's like any, any other identity, you be who you feel like it's you. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. And we're going to love you regardless of anything. But moving away from the religious talk because we've talked about it quite a bit um (laughs) so throughout the book jason's dead name is never used once was that an intentional choice yes so really early concepting this i was thinking about like how am i gonna write this without like misgendering him at the beginning of the book because he doesn't really know he's trans and he doesn't know that's an option and then I was like wait a, wait a minute what if I did this like first person instead and I was like oh actually the whole thing would work better in first person because it's like his personal emotions his personal journey and it, it's a very popular option for YA because it really gets you into that person's POV and then I'm like oh my god then I never have to make up a dead name for him I don't know what it is because it's not important I love that I love that. That was one of the first things amazing. I noticed in reading mm-hmm. it, and I was like, genius writing. Like, even it, like, later on, when it's yeah. when they get Rebecca out of the hole, it's it's not... I just love it. I love it. Um, all right. In chapter four, Jason mentioned something called a boundary name. And for me, this was a concept I was very unfamiliar with before reading the book. So I was wondering if, Devin, you could explain what a what a boundary name means in the context of like the story. I I don't think, I don't know if that's an actual term, but it was just something that I was trying to like convey as an idea of like, when you're like exploring that trans identity, you're trying to pick a name that's like safe. So you're like, you're not bold enough yet to, to pick a fully firmly gendered name, but you don't want to have like, your current gender either so you're trying to pick a name that's like unisex or sounds unisex you know you're gonna go with like maybe chris because people might interpret it as either christopher or christina you might pick like 
Danny, because that could be Danielle or Daniel. You know, you're like, you want to pick that in between kind of safe option that you're like not going to scare people too much or make them feel weird. And I was like, okay, that definitely is something a lot of trans people experience because um, you're a little bit uncertain yet about like really going for it and uh, expressing your identity fully and, you know, just as then like I'm putting it out there because you're a little bit uncertain yet about like really going for it and uh, expressing your identity fully and, you know, just as then like I'm putting it out there now that I, you know, I'm picking my gender and I don't care what you think about it. Yeah, thank you. I fi- I figured that's what he was going for, but I, like, I really love that explanation because like at the point, like Jason was really t- trying to figure out like A, who he is and like, what do I call myself? Which is a a, a very interesting qu- thing to have to figure out. Like not only like who, what do I identify with, but like, who am I? Like what, because there's power in words and names and things like that. So I, I like that kind of concept. Like as Jason's figuring it out, like the name shifts just like little by little until like, He's like, Jason, Jason, that's the, that's the one. That's me. All right. So it wouldn't be a top tier queer book if there wasn't a romance, right? So <laughs> as Jason comes to Rainbow Island, he, he, he meets Sky, the queer buccaneer, which we love. We stand our bisexual pirate queen. We love her. <laughs> and that relationship, first of all, is so just adorable. It's adorable. Um, one aspect of their relationship that I really love is how Jason, as it progresses, Jason is very self-conscious, um, when he's on their first date and how different the relationship with Sky is than like Rebecca. That's like, like what he's kind of contrasting them with. And we, as the reader. So with Sky, Jason's like very openly dating her as a man and is, and you know, as his true self. But at that point where they're like having their first date or they're starting to date, He's at the point where he's like, still doesn't feel like his body matches with who he is. And I think at one point he's like, damn boobs, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> 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 and so because of like the body dysmorphia a little bit, he kind of doesn't feel like, quote, like a real man. So ha- personally, having never been on this particular journey, I'm curious, like, what is the process for like reconciling like physical and emotional gender expression? Because that seems to be what Jason was kind of like going through at that point. Yes, and a lot of it is, you know, it's a very personal journey for every different queer person and some trans people can't ever really feel comfortable in their bodies until they have like a full physical surgery and others don't want any surgery at all and there's like a whole range in between and I wanted to at least express um, some of that struggle because I struggle with that too. a long for a long time about you know I can never be like a real boy because I have a girl body and then I wanted to kind of express that kind of the twofold of like speaking directly to the trans community and you know especially even like younger people who don't understand their identity yet or aren't out and also just sharing it for um, cisgender people to understand what that feels like and um, having, you know, a young character like Jason figuring out his identity, it was a, a really great character choice to have somebody being able to share that for both sides of that kind of um, readership. And um, I, one of the other really specific things I wanted to put in there was having an older trans man be his mentor, that he can talk to somebody who's completely comfortable in his identity, comfortable in his body, got you know he's got a woman in every port or whatever like he's just like this complete like total badass guy that's like everybody loves him and i wanted jason to have that experience of seeing like his future basically a future possibility for himself that i could you know i could be accepted in the community i can be respected i can have you know romantic relationships people aren't going to misgender me and judge me i can just be myself i can be happy and comfortable in my body and I have these like conversations that he has you know, like, pretty, you know, real guttural like conversations about physical body parts that he has with uh, Captain Agosti, his, his mentor. And uh, Jason has part of like that journey of understanding, like he starts to become a little bit more comfortable in himself and understanding like no matter, no matter what the shape of my body is, that doesn't determine who I am. And I can start to understand, even if I'm not 100% comfortable with my physical self, 
I'm not going to be judged by what I look like. I'm going to be accepted for who I am and who I tell people I am. So his, his some of his dysphoria starts to lessen as he finds himself in this community of acceptance. And like I, I very much changed my own view of myself and my body over time. And I'm way more comfortable than I have ever been before. And it's just, you know, part of it is just accepting myself and uh, being living in a world where, you know, all the people that I interact with, like, see me as a man and treat me as a man. And that changes so much about any kind of negativity I felt about, like, how I might look and how, you know, things like that. So I wanted to put some of that in there and like kind of like, you know, Catherine Agassi is sort of also kind of like a fantasy future self for me, where in the same way that Jason is like a fantasy past self for me. I love that so much. Yeah, it just it felt really real. And it was really I, I, I like the first person choice, like you said, to really like, get really understand through Jason's own thoughts, like, how that whole process kind of goes and what he feels and like the action reaction, like, when he meets Augusty and things like that. So yeah, thank you for writing that. It was, I, I love that part in the book. It's really well done. So I have a little small passage from the book that I noted immediately after I read it because it struck me and I just wanted to get everyone's reaction to it. So I will read it out loud. That's one of the best things about being a rainbow person we can make our own families with only people that love and understand us. Found family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, just the concept that family isn't blood. Blood. Necessarily. I mean, figuring out who you are and then once you accept yourself, uh, if you didn't from the beginning, uh, I mean, I found, I guess, who I would call my family after coming out and, like, I mean, no one's in the same state as me, but <laughs> online it helps. Uh, I think it's true, especially in the queer community. Like, you, ha you find your family because blood isn't always going to be there for you. But I thought it was really interest an interesting choice to have a, a actual blood relative of Jason also yes. in yeah. the island. Like Jason's cousins there. And so I thought that was interesting too. Like it seems like they get closer because like the curtain's gone. Like they're just like being themselves and like it it bonds them closer together. So mm -hmm. it also shows that like families can be healthier if we stop trying to force people into boxes mm -hmm. and just let them yep. be and just love people for who they are. Like mm -hmm. blood relation or not. So I like that choice to have like an actual blood relative there too. The versatility and it's also, of of relationships and family. And it's also just like, you know, what are like the chances of another person in your family of origin being queer is incredibly high. So, uh, you know, that's <laughs> mm -hmm. just like be, remember to be open to that possibility and whether they're out or not um you never know who's gonna you know turn out whatever you know a cousin aunt uncle whatever like you never know somebody in your family also might be queer and you got to be open to the possibility that maybe someday they'll reach out to you and and you'll be able to develop like a positive relationship with them uh, a lot of the family stuff was really really hard to write um because again i wrote this in november 2016 after um, like finding out that some of my family members had voted for you know who and i went no contact with them immediately uh so i have a very awkward strained relationship with my family because parts of them i don't talk to at all and other parts of them it's like this kind of like there's these subjects that we just don't touch and it, it feels like i kind of like divorced my family in 2016 and that was all the you know the, all of the like gut reaction stuff that Jason has to his family is like really honest and in the moment. Um, so some of that stuff when I I was rereading it this week because it's been a while and I was like, oh, I yeah, that was straight from the heart. Some of that stuff, that feeling of like love and hate twined together and this anger about why, why would you do this to me? Why would you view people like me like this when you had to know, you know, like you got to know. And why are you supporting this negativity and this hate 
when you know you've got to have a gut feeling that I'm one of them. So why is it like this? And um, and then, you know, of course, all the acceptance in the Rainbow Islands and building your own family and how quickly he starts to develop these really deep relationships with people he literally just met, you know, like weeks in, he's just, he feels closer to them than he's ever felt to his own blood relatives. And that's a very clear experience that a lot of people have. And like, I, you know, I have people in my life now that I've had for years and they, they feel like family. They're people that I rely on. They're people that like have my back and I never have to ever, ever question my acceptance with them because they're, uh, you know, they've been from day one accepting because they're most of the time they're also queer. And even those who aren't, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I am who I am up front and they got to know right, right away. And if people aren't accepting, like you just kind of let them go. <laughs> I think the realization that you're able to, like, it's okay to let blood relatives go is very powerful in itself because so many people are like, oh, that's your parent that's your brother or cousin or aunt or uncle and like you have to like be okay with them forgive them like no if they're really not good for you just let them go i'm sorry like this is something like i had a therapist tell another person it was like root therapy that they should try talking to them and i'm like no they don't have to if they don't want to they're terrible for them they're constantly beating you down. You don't need people like that. So just seeing Jason uh, find his family and literally, but <laughs> uh, it just, you see how much happier he is by the end. And it's really nice to see. Yes. Happy queers. It was very, that was the best part no, of the book. Yeah. <laughs> the best part is the happy queers all it's the so way. so happy. Can we fun. please have a TV show that's called yeah. that? <laughs> happy, happy queers. queers. <laughs> We're just like a bunch of queer people living in one house. <laughs> Be like happy feed, except with queers. <laughs> Maybe not a really weird concept. <laughs> you've, you've been in here, you know, it's crazy. Um... So, Devin, I was on your website because I love to do my research for these uh, interview type things. And I noticed that you have a playlist for the book. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose the music for you? For it? Not you. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do playlists for a lot of my books. And it's kind of like um, a combination of like vibes and um, characters and then things that like remind me of like the plot stuff and I just like to and it, it all I'm like really picky so it has to be something that I know I can listen to like many many times so there's sometimes like this song is super fitting but I'm kind of tired of it after like you know I listen to it once and I'm like yeah that's cool but not not making the playlist so it's got to be something I'm like I know I'm going to listen to this probably like 50 times while I'm writing this book it's got to be something that I really really like so that's what, like the Rainbow Islands, and some of it, I really randomly stumbled on some of those songs, and I was like, "Whoa, that one, that one's perfect." Like some stuff I knew, like oh, you know, some songs I like. I'm like, "Yeah, that's gonna go on the playlist." And other stuff I just randomly stumbled on, and they were perfect fit for you know the feeling at the time. I like uh, "Run" is I call that sky song because <laughs> that really reminds me of that feeling of sky is like the freedom of her and the the playfulness of that kind of emotion and i i was like that's that's her song for sure that's going on the playlist <laughs> that's so good i love that that's awesome what do you think the benefits are of having a playlist for the book um it's it gives me the uh mindset of the book itself and it, it kind of ties in like that emotional feeling and it helps to kind of give me like a um like a, a parameters around the work itself it's like okay so i try to make my playlists roughly around like 45 minutes or something because that's about as long as i can go at one time um really good and focused and then um i need to like take a break and walk away like even for like physical health like get out of the chair um so i try to put a roughly that many songs on there and then i will a lot of times go into a writing session and just hit play on that playlist and go and and kind of get into that emotional mindset of, of 
what the book is and the characters are and, and it helps to kind of give me the vibe and it also is giving me like almost like a timer too and I can kind of feel like as the songs change like I kind of know where I am and like the time and it's just kind of nice to have all of that you know musical accompaniment as you're writing too sometimes it's hard in silence it's a little bit mm -hmm. sometimes a little difficult to get into that mindset well it's great theora also does playlists for things yeah, that she I do writes too. and it's you do that too mm -hmm, i just yeah. never thought of that i just i just listen to music to i have to have music I when i write the same thing over <laughs> and over um I can't have music when I write, but I like will listen to me. Like I will do like you, Devin. Like I'll have like character playlists or like yeah. Does it remind me of like the specific plot that I'm trying mm -hmm. to plot out? And I'll listen to it like throughout the day when I'm not writing because that's when my mind wanders. And then I'll be like, oh yeah, and I'll like solve problems while like my brain's not thinking about it. But when I'm writing, I need like silence or instrumental music because I get distracted by lyrics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I have the, to do instrumental. The ADHD makes me need two things going at one time. So, uh, yeah, like a lot of times, it's like the playlist is is songs that I'm familiar enough with that it um it, it like the lyrics don't distract me because it's like just something I'm like used to. But there are it times the background too, almost. Yeah, yeah, and there, but there are times where lyrics can be kind of distracting to me, and I do have like a, a like a huge playlist of like instrumental stuff that I sometimes pop on just for general writing sessions, or like if I'm feeling kind of like squirrely that day, and like my brain won't settle down to like a lyric type thing, and I get distracted. Sometimes I just put on like instrumental music, so yeah, that's an option too for me. A lot of times, I'm like okay, I just need to see hear hear something to keep me active. Sometimes I do it in silence because I get so, you know, I sit down to write and I get so into what I'm doing that I just actually keep going even though I'm not playing anything, but it's kind of all mood based. Mm -hmm. That's vibes, <laughs> like you said. Mm -hmm. So I have the biggest question we'll ever ask you. Okay, <laughs> here it goes. Yes. Is there any chance we will get to read more about this world in the future? For example, here are some suggestions from our friend Pete. Uh, a sequel about liberating the conversion camps. Or a prequel about the first island inhabitants or Captain Augusti. 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 I, like, part of me would really like to go back and write stuff because it, it was such an amazing world. But also part of me is like, I wrote the story I wrote and that feels done. Because that was really what I was trying to express mm -hmm. is like Jason's emotional journey and this, you know, plot of like basically <laughs> happy ending of destruction. But you know, it. Um, I, I felt like when I finished it, I was like, that feels like done for me. That's the story I wanted to tell. And I know, like, it's it's a really fun world, and I, I like a lot of people have been like, what? Where's the sequel? Where's the sequel? I'm like, I I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna come up with an idea that's going to like compel me so much that I'll go back to that world. Like I, I love that world, but the story is the story. And I feel like I, I finished it. I feel like that's fair. And it's yeah, a great so fair. story on its own. Um, Pete had two more questions for you. One, just a question about like earlier drafts of the book. If there's anything you tell us about them, like were they vastly different from like the final product or anything you changed or like added or just any tidbit. I wrote during NaNoWriMo and it was like chaos. Like <laughs> it was, I really think like this book in a lot of ways, like saved me um, because it was so, I mean, I, you know, early November, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And, and by the time of the election, I, I was looking at this book going, I like, I have to finish this. I have to keep going. It's so important to me. And it's like, I would love to put this book out into the world, especially the way things have gone. And also just, you know, thinking like, I don't know if I've been writing anything else, if I'd been able, if I would have been able to keep going, um, cause it was so hard. And, uh, like I would struggle, you know, for weeks I'd sit down and just be like, I don't know how I can do this, but I kind of felt like I needed to finish it for myself and and it just was like i i've made 
pretty much everything out as I went. <laughs> it was like chaos. I sat down and I was like, what could I throw at them now? Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're in the ocean. Uh, Kraken, let's put Krakens in. And it was just entertaining myself day by day to just keep going. And like there, there were some incredibly clunky run on sentences and like awful paragraphs. And there were entire chunks, like pages long. There were days that were so hard that literally pages long of me just like talking to myself about what I could do next in the book. Um, so it was like a mess and chaos. And by the and then I finished that first draft and one NaNoWriMo, which I, I, I'm kind of addicted to NaNoWriMo. I win every year. Um, <laughs> I finished it and I put it aside for a while and I picked it up again and I read it and like obviously there's like huge chunks that are immediately going to have to go because they're not actually book. But as I was reading it, I was like, this is surprisingly coherent as far as like the overall plot, even though I totally was making things up as I went along. I was like, how did this, how did my brain come up with this in this highly stressful situation? I don't know. I surprised myself. Um, <laughs> I was just reading the book this, this past week, and I was like, who knows this? It's good. <laughs> but I, I cleaned up the immediate mess first. I like, oh got it. <laughs> I cleaned up the immediate really terrible stuff first, and then I sat down and like was like, okay, what, what, what really needs to like be like finessed and fixed and whatever? And like, honestly, like I admittedly like there a huge amount of that book is. Um, I mean, obviously, like cleans the sentences and and stuff like that, but a lot of that was just came out purely as it is in the book, um, especially like a lot of the emotional stuff just is the way it was in the first draft. And I actually didn't have to, I was, I did way less work than I thought I would have to do while I was in the middle of that first draft. I thought it was going to be like, this is going to be a nightmare to fix. And that really was surprisingly not that hard and in, in, um, the subsequent drafts were much, much easier because I had already the base to go on, but then I knew where I was going so that everything that felt like really like random and extraneous, I would either like build on that to make it more like, okay, this actually fits more in the book or I'm like, all right, that's got to go because that just didn't go anywhere in the first drafts. But I'm surprised that it actually is semi-coherent by the end of that month because that was really hard. Honestly, that is so amazing. And I love that it was like a comfort for you to kind of like write it at that point in time in your life because it's a comfort to read it. So like, I love that. That's amazing. Like truly like well done. Thank you. Uh, last question from Pete. This may be a long shot too, but Pete wants to know if there will ever be official merch for Rainbow Islands. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Pete wants to know if there will ever be official like merchandise. Oh, a merchandise mm. for the book. I I've never thought of that. <laughs> I don't know. I I can always uh. like, I can always like, make a t-shirt or something. <laughs> I mean, like, here's this. Have you ever thing. seen those? Like, people will get sketches done of their D and D characters. Uh. Yeah, I think there should be like a whole sketch of all of the characters and then they can just be on a freaking t shirt. <laughs> yes. With the rainbow. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Especially First the crew. Like the, the pirates. Yes, buccaneers. Man, I need that. The buccaneer shirt. And then in a <laughs> ship with the kraken, like trying to Yes. And... Be, yeah, baby. I yeah, I haven't really thought about that because like didn't occur to me but like that's the the great thing about being indie is like it's my book i can do whatever i want with it i don't have to ask you know a publisher mm -hmm. for permission it's all mine yep you need merch ideas we got them <laughs> we have way too many ideas for merch mm -hmm. <laughs> we do. well that's all the questions we have Devin. uh Thank you so much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it and loved getting to know you better and the book. Uh, before we sign off, do you have any final words for the listeners at home? Hmm. Just, I think um, the world has become 
even more difficult for queer people in the last few years. And my hope is that something like Rainbow Islands and other queer media out there can help give us the strength to keep fighting to show um, younger people and people who aren't out to themselves yet that there's hope and love and community and family out there for you, even in the dark times that we live in. Um, like share that love, share that community. Uh, we're gonna need that light in all of this darkness. And, you know, remind yourself that there are things fight worth fighting for. There's family worth fighting for. Yourself is worth fighting for. Don't put yourself in a box. Don't don't hide yourself for you know to to because of the judgment of other people. Let yourself go to those islands and be free. Be free with yourself. Be free with each other. Accept each other and love each other. And and you know we, we can get through this um, together. Um, and and that's you know worth fighting for. Amazing. I'm gonna go Thank cry. You. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, making me cry two times. That's so beautiful. <laughs> You're really good at pulling on people's emotions. I guess you should be a writer or something. <laughs> I don't know. Just throw that Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> to everyone at home listening, make sure to check out Rainbow Islands to support Devin and follow Devin on social media. Uh, until next time. Uh, gay it up all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Hyper lesbian Jesus? I don't know. <laughs> and get it up all over the place. <laughs> oh my gosh, sorry. That was a terrible outro. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> and with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content. If you'd like to support us, check out our merch store, or join our Patreon for early access to episodes, exclusive content, and so much more!